Hi, everybody. So I'm going to begin with a letter narrating a dream. On Saturday, 10th of August, 1957, I heard a voice speaking to me quite distinctly in a dream, which told me that the explanation of the cause of cancer was this. When it happened that two quite normal elements in a person came into a particular relation, these elements fused and touched off the beginning of cancer. It was not that there was necessarily an excess or minority of either. It was only that their relationship to one another that was fatal. The combination of numbers that opens a safe. A sort of zero hour when the clock and the minute fingers of the clock come to a certain time. The author of this letter goes on to describe their quest to find the proper audience for this story. Um, for what they have heard in their dream. For many years I searched for the doctor to whom this explanation meant something, feeling in view of the many people becoming ill with cancer that it was an urgent matter to pass these facts on. My doctor friends to whom I sent it were sympathetic but unable to explain the dream at all. Um, finally, the dreamer hears a doctor giving a public lecture in an adult education center and after the lecture, the dreamer writes to the speaker and receives a positive response. And so then, then the letter quotes from the doctor who's written back. There's no doubt in my mind at all that the cause, treatment and prevention of cancer lies in the combination of two perfectly normal constituents of the human body. These are catalase and hydrogen peroxide. If not in a proper state of balance, the result can be the production of tumors. And um, the doctor also mentions that several other sensitives have written to him out of the blue, telling him that this was the cause of cancer during the past five years. <coughs> so some of us as historians might be quite wary of the dream discovery narratives that are associated with famous scientists. Um, two examples would be August Kekule's vision of the structure of benzene when he dreamt of a snake eating its tail and Otto Loewy's work on the human nervous system. Um, we might be wary um, and hesitant to uh, make much of dream discovery narratives because they can feed into the myth of the inspired genius that sidelines many other historical factors. But what happens when people who are not destined to become famous scientists make discoveries in their sleep? The inspired visions of grocers, lorry drivers, housewives and schoolmasters um, are the subject of my current research into prophetic dreams after 1900. And my main research question is how does prophecy relate to the competing discourses of modernity um, that are offered to us in the outline for this meeting? Um, I'm just a quote from the description of this workshop. Every new kind of knowledge tried to achieve social, political, economic, and philosophical legitimacy by promising a better future world. And um, prophecy with its religious history and associations um, might seem to be one kind of promise that has no role to play in writing the history of modern scientific disciplines. But I'm going to invite you to spend a little bit of time among non-elite dreamers of the mid 20th century and I hope to show that the discourse of prophetic vision is very much a part of how science and technology acquire meaning in everyday life. So my research is focused on prophetic dreams after 1900, but I've also been looking around at how prophetic visions were collected and processed in earlier periods. And perhaps the oldest collection of dreams is found in the Royal Archive of Mari, which was discovered in Syria in the 1930s. Um, it dates from the second millennium BCE. And in this archive, um, there are tablets um, with people's visions and dreams recorded on them. They were recorded by administrators, and they were sent to the king along with a piece of hair and a piece of the hem cloth from the person who had the vision. And the hair and the cloth um, uh, are thought to have been a part of a ritual test to determine whether it was a true prophecy that had been seen. And the archive of the Mari king, Zimri Lim, 
um, is useful because it does preserve a few examples of dreams by people of low status alongside the dreams of important people that were close to the king. The dreams of people were harvested, the value of a vision was controlled through a ritual, and the implications of the dream were managed through activities to ensure the king's continued good fortune. So perhaps he had been neglecting a certain temple, this kind of thing. Um, so um, now we get in our time machine and we go from ancient Babylon to Wales in 1966. Um, in October 1966, a massive pile of mining waste collapsed over the village of Aberfan, um, covering a school and killing over 100 children. As TV and newspaper images of the tragedy began to circulate, reports started to come in of premonitions that people had had. They'd seen the TV images um, in their sleep before, before the disaster. And these examples were collected by a psychiatrist called John Barker. He was a consultant employed at a hospital in Shrewsbury in the West Midlands. He had studied medicine at Cambridge and he'd written a thesis on Munchausen syndrome. Um, some of his research involved um, using aversion therapy as a cure for gambling. Um, he was also a member of the Society for Psychical Research. And the themes of premonition and gambling have a long and uh, established relationship. Um, Barker teamed up with the science correspondent of the London Evening Standard newspaper and together they launched a media appeal for cases of premonition um, relating to the Aberfan tragedy. And they received around 75 replies from people who had had visions before the event and around half of these were from dreams. Barker discussed these premonitions in the Journal for the Society for Psychical Research and there was also some coverage in the British Medical Journal. And he detected a pattern in these testimonies. Um, and from this, he developed a theory of human seismographs. Um, these are subjects whose premonitions are accompanied by specific <coughs> medical symptoms. And this is from his 1968 book, uh, Scared to Death. Although they have no precise forewarning of the nature or situation of an impending catastrophe, they appear to develop intense mental and physical unease for a variable interval beforehand. Their symptoms include severe anxiety, oppression, depression, headaches, lack of concentration, choking sensations, difficulty in breathing, and feelings of constriction and suffocation. Their distress is relieved after the disaster has occurred or upon hearing news of it. I have termed this constellation of symptoms the pre-disaster syndrome. <coughs> Barker also speculated on a system for collecting and analyzing premonitions um, in order to intervene and pre prevent disasters in the future. <coughs> the public should be invited to report their premonitions to a central clearinghouse, perhaps linked to a computer. The latter could be used to detect peaks or patterns in the reports and to sift out false, trivial and irrelevant information. An official early warning could then be issued if the nature of the impending disaster could be determined. Unfortunately, Barker died the same year his book was published in 1968. But he did live just long enough to set up the British Premonitions Bureau with his journalist collaborator named Peter Fairley, whose articles for the London Evening Standard at the time of Aberfan included a feature on the future of computing. And to my knowledge, the Bureau never arrived at the computer analysis stage. Um, but hundreds of people wrote letters and phoned up with their dreams and premonitions. Um, and these were marked with the time and date on receipt. I wish somebody would make a film about the British Premonitions Bureau, <laughs> Ealing Comedy. A parallel organization was set up in New York, the American Central Premonitions Registry, and it was set up around the same time. So in the first year of their operation, the British Premonitions Bureau received over 1,000 replies. And as Peter Fairley moved jobs, uh, the Bureau moved with him, first of all, um, to the independent TV channel, ITV, 
and then to the TV Times. And the records continue to be kept until the early 1980s, and then the trail goes cold, and we don't know where, where the boxes are today. One day they will turn up in somebody's attic, I hope. <laughs> Um, so, despite the lack of these records, it is still possible to get a very good idea of the kind of dreams and premonitions that people were having in Britain in the 1960s. And this is thanks to a TV appeal that was made um, a few years earlier by the British playwright and broadcaster J.B. Priestley. So, I'll just give you a little bit of background on Priestley. He was born in Bradford in the north of England. Uh, his parents were a schoolmaster and a mill worker. And he served in the First World War. He managed to get promoted to become an officer. And then he had an officer's, a small officer's grant, which enabled him to study English and history at Cambridge University. He worked as a journalist. And um, although he's not so well known now, he was very, very familiar um, in the 20th century. And um, he was often heard on the radio. He, um, was involved in many broadcasts that were aimed at raising morale at home during the Second World War. So he was a very comforting uh, person. Um, but he is best known for his plays, and, and these revolve around the manipulation of time. They were inspired by a, very, um, a range of philosophies, Ospensky's theory of eternal recurrence and J.W. Dunn's theory of serialism, which I'm going to come back to Dunn later on. Priestley was also an important figure in promoting the work of Carl Jung in Britain, um, largely through radio broadcasts in the 40s and the 50s. So, on the 17th of March, 1963, Priestley was interviewed on the BBC Sunday night arts programme, Monitor, about his forthcoming book, Man and Time. Um, do I have a picture? Yeah. Lots of pictures. Um, on the broadcast, he discussed his own experience of precognitive dream. He'd had a dream, um, and then he realized it came true when he was visiting the Grand Canyon. That's one of, one of his examples, the Grand Canyon dream. Um, and at the end of the show, the viewers were invited to send in their own stories, their own examples of how they have hopped out of, time, out of linear time. And some of these stories were then selected, and they were included in, in this book. So um, the response to this appeal in 1963 was unexpectedly high. Barker tells us he received 75 replies specifically about Abba Fan. There was a radio appeal earlier in 1934 by a researcher from the Society for Psychical Research. They received around 300 replies. Priestley received 1,400 letters. Um, <coughs> and these letters are um, in the archives in Bradford and in Cambridge. And they're a, a very rich resource for social history. People are talking about their relationships. They're talking about what they're reading. Yes, we can find what, you know, stories about what people are reading in their everyday life, what they're watching on TV, and very detailed descriptions of people's religious experiences and the conflicts they're having <coughs> around belief. There was a very high degree of trust in Priestley, um, partly because, as I've mentioned, he was a household name from his broadcasts and his plays. Um, but it was also really important that he had a status as a storyteller. He was not a religious leader. He was not a scientific authority. And he was free as a storyteller to critique um, other cultural authorities. So people um, really trusted him with experiences that they couldn't really find a home for. Um, people would laugh when they told them what, what if they had a dream that come true, or they'd be told not to talk about it, or they would go mad. Um, and so they, there was a lot of confidences that people would send in their letters to him. And so I've had to think about ethics when I'm doing this project, because these people could still be alive. They're still data subjects. Um, so um, it's really frust it's not frustrating, but it's, it's tricky, because the the very things that would identify someone are part of the social history story that I want to tell, but they're also the things that I have to be careful with. So the cause of cancer dream that I began with is one of the letters on that table. Um, <coughs> and that's just one example of a, um, a dream that then is followed by a waking encounter. 
with a scientific or medical professional. And um, I want to thank Jaume for this conference because the category of promises is helping me um, to think about um, the relationship between somebody who experiences a prophetic dream and the discourses of scientific authority. So in the center here I have the, this is the dreaming subject, someone who has a very promising mind because they're having these dreams that come true. Um, and then I'm not really going to discuss this. I've got a paper coming out in studies of the um, history and philosophy of the biomedical sciences, I think next year, where I talk about the encounters that people have with psychiatry and psychology when they relate their story of prophetic dreams. Um, and one, so the Freudian explanation for prophecy is that it's wish fulfillment, that you're making a promise to yourself. Um, but I'm not going to talk about this today. I'm going to mainly be talking about um, the way in which when people have a, a dream that relates to science and medicine, that the prophecy is a, a rival discourse um, to um, scientific authority, um, or it's, it may be criticizing the power of science. Um, and then at the end, I'm going to talk very briefly about the um, the fact that people are dreaming about the future relates to the promise that we can develop a higher mind. Obviously, that has a long history, um, or we might reawaken ancient powers. And then I'm also going to talk very, very briefly about um, the promise that science itself will eventually um, get a handle on how it is possible to have a dream about the future. And, and this, this is also a promise that it would explain and validate um, psychic powers. So visions of the future have been a threat <coughs> to professional expertise for a long time. And Cicero in 45 BCE, do you think that a prophet will conjecture better whether a storm is at hand than a pilot, or that he will by conjecture make a more accurate diagnosis than a physician, or conduct a war with more skill than a general? Um, when Freud was establishing the scientific credentials for psychoanalysis, he used the metaphor of financial speculation to dismiss psychic knowledge. And this is from his 1921 essay um, on uh, psychoanalysis and telepathy. The methods of analytic technique will be abandoned if there is hope of getting into direct touch with the operative spirits by means of occult procedures, just as habits of patient humdrum work are abandoned if there is a hope of growing rich at a single blow by means of successful speculation. And in his broadcast and his book, Priestley was very critical of academic specialism. And in the Monitor broadcast, he emphasized his lack of math mathematical knowledge. And so therefore, people felt able to confide in him the knowledge that they had received without this patient humdrum work um, or professional expertise that is always emphasized by anti-prophetic authorities from Cicero to Freud and after. So there are a lot of people who describe in the letters how they have amazed or annoyed the doctor with their um, advanced knowledge and diagnosis of serious medical conditions. Um, and there are many people who have gained insights into the nature of time. One person um, talks about their, their father's gift for prophecy this person, the father, had many prophetic dreams, used them to save people's lives, um, and also developed a theory of time, um, which became, it was Einstein's theory, but it was before Einstein, um, a theory that time was dependent on motion. Another person says that, I have performed mathematical exercises and composed poetry quite beyond my normal capacity while dreaming. And um, just an incidental point, um, Reading these letters reminds me how compartmentalized I've been in my previous approach to the history of science. When I was researching the popular reception of relativity, it never occurred to me to um, think about the history of psychology or to go and read people's stories about their dreams. Um, but um, I was constantly racking my brains thinking, what did um, mass audiences um, think about the popular physics they were consuming in the media and in books and magazines? What was their response? How did, this, how did Einstein's relativity fit into the texture of their everyday life? And it's here in these letters that I find um, what I was looking for. 
Um, so um, dream records are maybe they're a neglected resource for studying um, public engagement with science and technology. So I began with the dream about um, the causes of cancer. Now I move on to um, a dream that features detailed plans for a machine to cure cancer. And I won't read to you the, um, the description of the machine, um, but the dreamer writes, I, this dream was so vivid that I reported it to my doctor, who didn't laugh at me, but inquired if I had recently been reading anything on this matter, which I had not. He suggested that I write to the Cancer Research Council, which I did, and I got a most appreciative letter for my description. That makes me think, in the archives of the Cancer Research Council, are there loads of letters for people who have written in their dreams about cures for cancer? That's something to follow up. So in some cases, the dream um, provides the support for formal studies, and there are lots of examples of people who are receiving help with their exams from having seen the questions and worked through the problems in their sleep beforehand. Um, my next example is a case of waking precognition. So you, if you're a talented person, you don't need to go to sleep to have a prophetic dream. You can have it while you're awake. <coughs> this person is trying to solve a very practical problem of electrical wiring in the home. And the solution arrives, and when uh, the person describes their solution to the other people in the house at the time, they say, oh, we've just seen an article on this in a magazine. It's over here. Um, so in cases like this, the published text, which is encountered after the vision or inspiration, has got a validating function. And um, uh, I hope I'm not going to offend your historical sensibilities too much, but I want to suggest a, a comparison between the, the hair and the cloth that was used as a ritual to validate um, an ancient Babylonian dream um, and the function of the media in validating prophecy in the 20th century. Um, I, won't, uh, I can talk about this in the questions if you like, and I'm, I'm going to be giving a paper at the end, end of May as a meeting in Manchester about science, religion, and entertainment media. And so I'm going to be developing um, the role of the media in validating prophecies at that meeting. Um, so for now, I, will, I just have one um, more example with a newspaper in it. Um, and this, um, <coughs> the newspaper arrives in relation to um, a dream about the atom bomb. So um, I'm going to read a longish expert excerpt <coughs> from one of the many letters on the theme of nuclear war. They were men in white coats, all watching. Not as I was, not feeling anything, just watching interestedly. I tried to shout to them, why can't you tell them not to look at the light? But they couldn't hear. Then, in awful slow motion, the sort of fog all went, and I started to see all the people that were making this awful moan. It was as though the ground was mo moaning and moving with them. Everything was dark grey except for this blood-red sun that was slowly getting brighter until it became very bright, too bright for me to see any more. By this time, I was quite frantic in my shouts to these men because they were not doing anything and I felt they could. I can only remember now that I kept shouting, look, you can't see. It's difficult to tell you how truly awful this was because I didn't see as much as I felt. I felt all the awful agony of this so much that I was quite ill for a few days. My mother noticed I was ill but thought I was worrying about my husband. She brought a paper up from the village about six days later and sat on my bed and said, You'll be glad, dear, that the war will be over soon and you'll see George again. And then I read about the atom bomb, and I knew just what and how it was, although there were no details about it. I came to know that later. But I didn't feel as shocked and horrified as other people did then, because I had been through it all before. And this is a common response to precognitive dreams of distressing events. The dreamer reports being better able to bear what follows in waking life, because they have rehearsed it in their sleep. So tragic events are a bit like exams. They're a life test that can be coped with better through practice. And not everybody uh, feels better able to cope. Some people are very oppressed by their prophetic dreams. 
Remember the symptoms described by Barker, these are described in a lot of the letters. People are really have sometimes are hospitalized because of the terror of waiting for the awful thing that they've seen in their dream. <coughs> the theme of science against humanity is a common one in the letters. Um, one person writes, the world seems like one big volcano getting ready to explode. Science will beat man. And in a way, this is not surprising because Priestley's appeal was broadcast in Mar March 1963, which is just a few months after the Cuban Missile Crisis. <coughs> um, but in the letters, people are reaching back over decades, sometimes even back to their, the dreams of their parents. So these visions of um, destruction of the world are not just about 1962. Um, there's, there's a lot of material in the correspondence for exploring um, the presence of atomic war in people's dreams. So, alongside criticism of science, there's also an optimistic and adventurous orientation to crisis and renewal that's shared between Priestley and his audience. Priestley himself believed that a new era was dawning, and in Man and Time, he pondered the reason why so many people were writing to him compared to the smaller response that was received um, by the previous psychical researcher, Edith Littleton, when she went on the radio in 1934. <coughs> and so Priestley speculates that, he notes that during the 30 years since her project, the pressure of conventional opinion against any idea of prediction has remained the same. However, more and more people resisting that pressure have had experiences that they are eager to tell. And he says during these years, something had begun to stir, but he doesn't tell us what it is that he thinks has begun to stir. However, his correspondents are very forthcoming with their own suggestions. Um, one person writes, I do so agree with your feeling that things are moving rather quickly. The Observer today gives its front page to the Bishop of Woolwich. It is exactly what my dear husband has been hoping for, expecting and waiting for, a breakthrough. I think we are in most exciting, if dangerous, times. But Christianity was always meant to be dangerous. I love some of the non-secretors in these letters. <coughs> the, spirit, the theme of spiritual renewal was, of course, not new in the 1960s. And it has many different forms throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. And run, these run in parallel with the professionalization and specialization in science. But one very influential example that I mentioned earlier is the aeronautical engineer J.W. Dunn. Um, in, in his best-selling book about precognitive dreams, an experiment with time. Dunn concludes his book with the statement that prophetic dreams are evidence of an immortal soul. And he, he proposes that we train ourselves um, to develop this capacity of seeing into the future. Um, and he suggests that each individual mind forms part of a super mind from which we obtain our powers of prophecy. He talks about um, a superlative general observer, the fount of all self-consciousness, intention, and intervention underlying mechanical thinking. And the superlative observer contains within himself a less generalized observer who is the personification of all genealogically related life and who is capable of human-like thinking and prevision of a kind quite beyond our individual capacities. In the superlative observer, we individual observers and that tree of which we are the branches, live and have our being. Um, so you might be wondering how a book with such an awkward e expository style could become a bestseller. An experiment with time stayed in print continually from the 20s until the 1980s. It was not out of print for very long. It's still in print now. Um, and I have a couple of, I'm not going to go into it now, but a couple of conjectures about his popularity. One is that um, his book functions as a, an allegory for the consumer of media. There are new, he uses newspaper reports and books, and is, it's very much a place in his project for the consumer of modern media. It's integral um, to this capacity for seeing into the future. The other thing is that I think um, his theory and his stories um, compensate um, the um, non-elite person for what Freud and Einstein have taken away from them. Um, so Freud has... Um, taken away um, people's access to their own mind. That's a very crude way of putting it, but um, his interpretation of dreams is there's no symbols. It's all literal. You have a dream about a red fox, and then you see a red fox the next day. 
Um, so it's restoring people um, a, a non-symbolic connection and relationship to their dreams. Um, also, Einstein has robbed people of the fourth dimension, which they're very fond of from science fiction. The expositors of physics are saying, you, relativity, I'm sorry, but you can't imagine the fourth dimension. It's not picturable. You can't have access to it unless you're very, very good at maths. Hey, even I don't understand it, and I'm a mathematician. Um, so people are being robbed of the fourth dimension of which they're very fond. And J.W. Dunn says that anybody, everybody, we all do it in our sleep. You just have to notice. So he's giving people direct access to traveling in time again. Um, but what I want to focus on for now is this tree of which we are the branches. And I want to put that into dialogue with the negotiation of promises that is seen in the letters to Priestley. There's a contrast to be drawn between correspondents who feel closely connected with others in their sense of a breakthrough and others who are in a more complex negotiation with received learning and cultural authority. So um, in this letter, there's a sense of um, close agreement between four people, the person writing, her husband, Priestley himself, and the Bishop of Woolwich. And again, it's a media outlet, the British Sunday newspaper, The Observer, that helps to validate this experience. Um, so we might say that this person feels very close to a main branch on the, of the tree, the tree of minds. But for other correspondents, the tree of minds is more convoluted. And um, I won't read out the whole letter, but this is from a self-taught person, and it's representative of many examples of working class readers who are confronting both the elusiveness of knowledge about time and the restrictions of language. I'm a lorry driver, and for many years I've been obsessed with this time factor. I've experimented with my dreams, and like yourself, have no doubt that the future is constantly being foreseen. I've read many books, talks about J.W. Dunn and others. Um, I feel without any qualification to, to the right to say it, that along with Darwin, Freud, Waite, Levi, all these people's writings, along with present-day psychology, are all about the one subject and have been confused by over-elaboration of the subject. I feel I have the answer. I have always felt I would get it. Um, I have no qualifications to ask for a hearing, but please don't dismiss this as a load of nonsense. I can't possibly explain it in a letter, a subject will, that will need 3,000 pages to get people to think about it. I can explain a lot better by mouth than pen. I hope I haven't confused you too much. There's a lot more in that letter, but I wanted to get on. Um, this person's experimentation with dreams gives them direct access to knowledge through feeling. And in this case, that is working in parallel with self-education through books. This is somebody who's making concerted efforts to learn, but is also aware that even among the experts, an over-elaboration of the subject can lead to confusion. Throughout that letter, there's a tension between the value of direct intuitive knowledge that defies expression in language and this need for 3,000 pages to adequately tackle the subject. In this lorry driver's testimony, the promise of getting the answer to the secret of time is in conflict with the promise of being able to communicate and bring, people, bring people's attention to this important discovery. And that's a pattern that recurs through the letters, um, that the insights people have gained through their dreams can have an isolating effect. And it's only when a figure like Priestley comes forward to receive their testimony that the prospect of, uh, arises of translating those insights into a promise that could be shared by others. So the harvesting of prophetic dreams in the 20th century has provided non-elite subjects um, with the prospect of participating in experiments that could promise to extend the reach of scientific authority to include psychic phenomena. Um, in the introduction to her book, Edith Littleton articulated the promises of scientific research in this area. <coughs> These cases of prediction are not printed merely as strange and impressive stories, but with the definite purpose of stimulating an interest in that scientific investigation of supernormal faculties of the mind, which is already beginning to show results pregnant with future discovery. And hopes at this time were largely pinned on the work of J.B. and Louisa Rhine at Duke University. Rhine first published his experimental results on precognition in 1938, but he had been rushed into print um, 
there were researchers in England who'd begun to publish their own findings, and this compelled him to print before he was ready. In a 1936 letter to one of the English researchers, Tyrrell, he urged caution. If we make a false move in this delicate matter, I think it would be very bad for the whole subject. On the other hand, if we can make sure of the case, even though it takes many years, it will be one of the most phenomenal discoveries that science will have made. Of course, it will be a matter for many laboratories before the thing is done. The more of us who can work calmly and surely and not publish too hastily, the better it will be. The promises of science in relation to psychic phenomena have not been realized, but not so far. And the 20th century is a story of losing battles to secure the necessary funding and resources. <coughs> Unfolding in the space of this endlessly deferred promise, prophetic dreams in everyday life are a resource which I hope I've persuaded you can be considered alongside those other, perhaps better institutionalized discourses of modernity that seek legitimacy by promising a better future world. Thank you. Again, so it's recorded. Another chance to talk, talk about A.M. Lowe because uh, he is very much interested in the, the paranormal. I don't know whether the, the, the dreaming, but certainly telepathy. And he thinks science mm. will be able to crack it uh, and provide a rational explanation for what are regarded as paranormal events. And of course, he's very much into this popular uh, culture. He, he's much more uh, a sort of J.B. Priestley kind of... Um, yeah. Uh, comfortable figure that the, the man in the street could relate to uh, than the sort of a uh, normal academic uh, expert. Uh, do, do, does he uh, actually t uh, deal with pre uh, dreams and premonitions? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if you could uh, mention that or perhaps say something about whether he could fit into the story more. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to include A.M. Lowe in any story. <laughs> He's just marvellous, <laughs> the professor. Um, in an early issue of Armchair Science, the readers are offered a quite substantial reward um, if they can settle this question that the scientists are just shilly-shallying over, which is whether psychic powers are real or not. And um, so they're offering um, a quite a rich uh, reward um, for anyone who can write in and, and settle this problem. I'm sure Lowe is behind, well, he's behind all of the best bits in Armchair Science. But also they have... Um, uh, uh, an interview with J.W. Dunn in Armchair Science, and um, in that they suggest that, that Dunn's theory was actually first elaborated on the pages of Armchair Science, um, which is, of course, at the forefront. Um, so it, Lowe is, is taking figures like Dunn and Eddington and Jeans as um, they are confirming stuff that he has already, the public already knows this stuff. The scientists are following them. Yeah. And very nice talk. Um, I, uh, in the same direction as Peter, I wanted to. I was surprised that you did not mention this very huge survey made by Podmore and Myers on uh, Frederick Myers on the premonitions, because I think there they received these kind yeah. of letters, and so it's. Uh, I think a similar s stuff and uh, would be interesting to see. Yeah. And the other thing, my question, uh, a second question, I have always two questions, sorry. Um, the relation of Priestley and Jung, because mm. uh, there is a, a more interesting than, than Freud, of course, in this mm. sense, as a, uh, in these anti-authoritarian uh, mm, movements in the 60s, I, I feel that, uh, that Jung is, is maybe a, a, a better reference. Mm. And there must be something, some influence. You, you mentioned it very shortly. If you yeah. Um, so yeah, thank you. But the um, the SPR um, have they have various projects through the 19th century and the 20th century to investigate um, precognition, and they have a lot of problems. Um, so uh, that's to be looked at in my project, definitely. Thank you. Um, and the Jung, there's um, what I can talk about right now is um, the references to Jung in the letters. Um, so there's a lot of references to Freud, there's also references to Jung, but it's quite interesting because people have m um, a more digested 
understanding of Freud. They're quite specific in using Freudian language. They agree or they disagree. The references to Jung in the letters are more diffuse, and um, there's been, they have, they've not had such a focused dissemination of Jung, I think. It, that's my tentative I, view of it. Um, but the, the references to Jung are quite lyrical and poetic and speculative. So that's as far as I've got with that, I'm afraid. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Katie. Mm. I loved your, your paper, of course. Um, I have a kind of general question. You may not have the answer to that, as all general mm. questions are. Um, I think I said it yesterday. One of the ideas, of the many ideas of promises that I had in mind, is because I'm somehow interested between, in the relationship between knowledge and time, right? Yeah. And when talking about prophecy, there seems to be the element of learning what is going to happen in the future as if the future is already mm. decided. So th <coughs> the thing of deterministic future. Mm. And in many of the talks we heard today with the apocalypse or yesterday, the thing is about we with science are able to construe our future. So in that context, any prophecy, yeah. it's, it's kind of challenging, right? Yeah. Uh, so I don't know if you've had any thoughts about that. Just, just as, uh, as a just minor thing, yeah. on the BBC website, you have a number of sections. And one is news, the other is environment, the other is science. The other is, and there's one section which is called future. Yeah. And most of the things in that section are mainly science and technology things, yeah. or so these bacteria or these DNA, DNA or whatever. But uh, OK, I go back to the question of uh, deterministic future, yeah. prophecy, make our own future yeah. technology. Yeah, the, the question of determinism and do we have free will is a big problem for time travel in science fiction and also it's confronted in um, anyone who talks about precognition has to deal with this. Um, and uh, Priestley's answer, he d d everyone that can make up their own theory of time, it's great fun. His one, being a man of the people, time is like an omelette just before you take it out of the pan or a tortilla. And uh, so its, it's shape is there. But there's some scope to intervene because some parts of it are still a little bit runny. <laughs> <laughs> the omelette of time. Well, thank you very much, Katie. Thank you.